okay. slide. Oh, no, you're on it. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you done it. Oh, he's ahead of me. All right. So um, I'm going to take questions. We do have a mic, Hi. which David will, if you raise your hand, David will give you the mic so everybody can hear the question and it will get onto the tape. Um, we do have some notes from the talk tonight, so if you want to get those notes, please go to the website um, MotherEarthWorks.com, which is um, David's website for Mother Earth Foods, and you can, um, they're not loaded yet, I've just given them to him today, but in the next week or so, you'll be able to access those notes and print them and bring them, you know, pull them in for yourself. Um, it's a text document, it's not the pictures, it's actually text about some of the things that we talked about and a couple of others as well. So do we have any questions out here? Yeah, we've got one over here. Earlier you were speaking about the garlic and most recently I bought a huge big bag of garlic cloves at Sam's and thought, oh, I'm not going to leave this in, you know, in the bottom of the fridge. I'm going to do things with it. So I put some in oil, some in vinegar, some you know, different things. But you said um, use it in two to three weeks. Yeah, the reason I suggested that you use up your garlic is actually in the, in the vinegar or the oil, you should be absolutely fine. I would keep them in a cool, dark place. Um, don't let the temperature change too much. A fridge would actually be ideal. I had one bad experience with the honey when I used very, very fresh garlic that was only dug a few days. And I think it had too much moisture in, and it reduced the sugar volume of the, of the or sugar content of the honey down. It diluted the honey, and the whole thing exploded. And I had garlic honey to hell. <laughs> I mean, I do literally mean exploded. It, it blew the top off. The, I had it in a big quart jar, and it blew the top. And... Um, yeah, that wasn't a nice experience. So, so actually, perhaps what I should say there is when you purchase garlic, it's been out of the ground for weeks at least, and it's dried off a bit. So if you've dug garlic fresh in the garden, set it aside for two or three weeks or a month or so before you work with it. That's all. Yeah. No, I, I, the, the question is, you have to heat the vinegar. Um, my recipe books all said bring the vinegar to boiling point. Now, I'm not going to tell you that what you've done is useless or, or not safe. I would just say it probably won't have as good a keeping quality, so you may want to use it up more quickly and certainly keep it in the fridge. And failing that, stick it in the freezer. Pour it off into small containers, like maybe into ice cube trays, freeze those, and then drop them into Ziploc bags for storage in the freezer, and then you can, I do a lot, I puree a lot of stuff and put it in ice cube trays to freeze, and then put those into the freezer in a Ziploc, and you just pull out a cube or two when you want it. Yeah. The other thing that we do with our huge amount of garlic that we harvest, it doesn't keep forever. So we have garlic peeling parties, and we put on some kind of audio lecture from a conference or something. We get a bunch of friends who are interested in a herbal topic and we put an audio on and we peel like crazy and then we freeze those. Other questions? BJ. I just, uh, uh, it's so, so overwhelming of all these properties and so on. How do you maintain a balanced uh, dosage or in food eating? I don't know how you can uh, balance these herbs and spices. No. So the question is, how do, we, how do we manage with so many options and so, so much stuff in there? How do we know how much to have? You know, I, I think I can answer it two ways. One is the common sense of healthy eating. What, what goes well in the kitchen? And so recipes that call for herbs and spices, there's kind of proportions in there that are generally going to be tasty. Maybe not quite enough to give you a therapeutic dose, but certainly every little bit helps. The other aspect is if you're actually sick, then you're gonna to need to do something a bit more. So, um, 
you might have your favorite recipes that you cook on a, you know, on a regular basis, but when you get sick, you might step it up to the, you know, the, the recipe with more garlic or more ginger. So perhaps I could best answer it by saying that um, in terms of herbal medicine and safety, when can you use herbs? How much can you use? When should you not use them? I think the rule of thumb is if you have a condition that you would normally go to your doctor to get advice about before embarking upon any treatment, then, and you don't want to do drugs, then you should go talk to a herbalist. But if you have the kind of condition that you would walk into the drugstore and self-select a remedy off the shelf, or even ask the pharmacist for a little bit of advice, those things you can treat yourself at home with herbs. You need some good books, maybe a few classes, um, but it's that common sense. If I would treat it myself anyways, then I would treat it with herbs instead of pharmaceuticals. But if I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what the condition is, I don't know how to approach it, and I need advice, then I would say go to a herbalist if you don't want to go to your physician. Um, these days, of course, many physicians are opening their minds to this as well, and you're getting some crossover, or they phone David, <laughs> um, you know, to ask about, my patients come in and they want to take turmeric, and is this safe, and how much should they take, and they'll phone an expert like David to get that information. So either way, it's, it's a common sense thing about what you would do, um, well, regardless of whether it's a herb or a drug, that would be kind of the, the dividing line. Uh, for the most part, the herbs are safe. There are very, very rare cases. You know, the, the herbs you have in your kitchen are all generally safe. There are poisonous herbs, and we do use poisonous herbs in a clinical practice, but those are not the ones that you're keeping in your spice cupboard at home. So if it's in the spice cupboard at home, it's pretty safe. Yeah. Others? Yeah. I read recently that um, cilantro is very good for cleating mercury, mm -hmm. but I'm not crazy about <laughs> cilantro. Will yeah. coriander do the same thing since it's from the same plant? Will which? Coriander. Coriander. Well, coriander is the seed of the cilantro plant. And no, the seed will not pull mercury out the way the leafy material does. It is true that coriander pulls mercury and copper out of the body. Black beans do it as well. So black bean salsa with fresh coriander is actually pretty good medicine. But the seed will not do that. No, sorry to disappoint you. And can you speak about dandelions? Oh, I can speak about dandelion. For a long time. Yeah, for a long time. Well, dandelion is, is again one of those herbal medicines that crosses the food medicine line because people eat dandelion greens and you can make kind of a coffee substitute out of the root, but it is also a medicine. So if you want to make a coffee substitute, you need to pick your roots in the fall. And that's the voice of experience because roots are usually harvested spring or fall because in the summer, all the energy of the plant is above ground and the roots are tend to be quite small and they're just a conduit. They're not storing anything in the, in the summer. So normally you'd pick roots of any plants, spring or fall, but in dandelion, it, um, it lays down a lot of sugars through the summer that are then used up through the winter to keep the plant alive, ready to grow for the spring. So you want to get your roots in the fall because they're sweeter, they're bigger, and they're also a little bit sweeter. The, the spring roots are very bitter. The fall roots are marginally bitter. And then you roast them, chop them, roast them, and grind them and make a coffee. Yeah. Um, the leaf is eaten as a green vegetable. Uh, the commercially available ones in the grocery store are a special cultivar that's not so bitter as the wild ones, but we already talked about bitters. Bitters are good medicine. So dandelion greens from your garden will be bitter, and you're not gonna have the whole salad of that, but in your, a little bit of it in your juice, in your smoothie, or some leaf in the salad is actually very, very good for you. The root is also somewhat bitter. The leaf tends to work a little bit more on the gallbladder, 
Um, so if you're prone to um, gallbladder congestion, not active stones, but just if you, if you don't tolerate fatty, rich foods well, you get a little bit of an upset, a little bit nauseous, a little bit uncomfortable in your upper right area here, then maybe dandelion leaf is useful. Dandelion root is a little bit more of a bowel stimulant. So it's not actually a laxative, but it's heading that way. So it just it softens the stool, gets you going a little bit more easily in the morning. So as a food, you're taking um, usually a cultivar that's not quite so medicinal. Um, and of course, if you're making the coffee and you put cream and sugar and all of that, it's not quite so medicinal. But herbalists use dandelion leaf and dandelion root as medicines quite a lot. The leaf is also diuretic, so it's quite useful for water retention. Um, the only thing I would caution you with dandelion is to make sure that you know what's been sprayed where it's where you're picking because it's on lawns and you know it's considered a weed so it's quite often sprayed so if it's your lawn and you know that your lawn doesn't do drugs then you're fine to pick but oh I have a bumper sticker that says my lawn doesn't do drugs actually we don't really have a lawn but um, but I have the sticker anyway that's great but if but if you're picking it on your neighbor or somewhere that you don't know the the treatment of that land. Be careful. Yeah. All right. One couple, couple more. I got one up here. Okay. Uh, can you address um, the combination of some drugs that complement each other? The combination of drugs or of I, herbs? I meant herbs. <laughs> I've heard the word drug before. With yeah. Combinations of herbs. Yeah. I mean, in the kitchen, obviously, it's a flavor profile. So you're going to look for complementary flavors. Um, some of you may have heard of the concept in perfumery of your base note, your middle note, and your top note. And you can think of that in your kitchen as well. Your base notes are going to be the deeper, richer flavors, the ones that linger the longest. Maybe you're not the first thing you taste in the food, but but come out a little bit later. Um, they tend to be the more resinous plants, the roots, the barks. The top notes are going to be the very first thing that you notice when you taste something or smell something. It's usually a lighter, more floral, more uplifting. So just in terms of flavor combinations, um, that's one way to think of it in the same idea as, of perfumery, to kind of create a spectrum. But in terms of medicine, you combine things according to the need of the individual. So, um, of course, in, you know, again, in the kitchen, there's traditional combinations of things that are put together. Um, but, but in terms of medicine, we would try to assess what the need is in that individual and then come up with a customized program that might be partly food-based and partly therapeutic use of herbs, whether that's in the food or taken separately. But that is the uh, four years of study that a beginner herbalist, herbal practitioner does. So um, a, a qualified herbalist has trained for um, a minimum of two years full time, and usually it's up to four years of, of training before you're launched into the public, into the unsuspecting public. Um, and so that's what we're learning. It's, we're learning the science. Yes, we learn the constituents and how to extract things. And we learn medicine and how to evaluate the body. But we also learn the art. And the art is an intangible skill. I can't define it and I can't tell you what it is. But it's a bit like a chef in the kitchen. You've got your day-to-day -day family cook that can put a decent meal on the table and everybody's happy. And that's maybe more like your f sort of lay herbalist. And then you've got your fine chef, you know, the, the artist in the kitchen, and that might be more the equivalent of the herbal practitioner. All very valid. Um, there's nothing wrong with a good basic home-cooked dinner. You know, your steak and kidney pudding is pretty good food. That's the Brit in me, of course. Um, but, uh, but, you know, chicken pot pie, whatever it is, it's just routine, standard mom's fare. Nothing wrong with that. But then if you want to go to the fine cuisine, you either go to a restaurant or you take some cooking classes. So it's that, you know, with, for a herbalist, it's that kind of dance between what's affordable, what's palatable, what's available, what season are we in, what climate are we in, and what's 
the issue for this person and how big of a medicine do they need? Because sometimes just doing it in food isn't enough. Sometimes, you know, big disease takes big medicine. So you have to kind of make a judgment call there about how much somebody needs. Yeah. Um, when you was talking about uh, horseradish, you only mentioned the root. I only mentioned the root of horseradish because um, the leaf is quite unpalatable. The leaf definitely is pungent, but it's very bitter as well, and it's also very tough. It's not nice to use. I do, however, harvest the flowers because I'm desperate to stop it spreading now. Anytime I accidentally, you know, I've let some get as far as flowering, I cut the flowering stalk and then I pinch off the individual flowers and sprinkle them onto salads. Mm -hmm. Now, how, is, how are the flowers? The flowers are pungent. Pungent. They and they pungent smell too. pungent. You walk through the garden and you can smell when it's in bloom. Good. Yeah, and they taste fine. They taste like mild horseradish, and they're really pretty. I'm all about edible flowers. I actually grow an edible flower garden because we sell edible flowers to a couple of fancy restaurants in the town, and uh, the horseradish flowers are actually very popular. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chen Chow. We appreciate your sharing with us this evening, and uh, we're going to be here for just a few moments, so I'm sure people might have some personal questions. I'm also about. doing David's radio show tomorrow, so if you have a burning question that you didn't ask or you think of in the middle of the night, phone C us. Or call us and talk yeah. to us, because somebody else has probably got the same question. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I have a few business cards down here. David, of course, has his business cards as well. 